Something unusual just happened aboard the ISS. For the first time in its 25-year history, a NASA mission was cut short because of an astronaut's medical issue. Crew 11 is coming home a month earlier than originally planned in February, and on the surface, that sounds like an isolated event. But it isn't. This sudden change has set off a chain reaction across NASA's entire flight schedule, and it points to a deeper problem that extends well beyond low Earth orbit, because once you follow that domino trail, it leads straight to Artemis II, the next crewed mission around the moon, and the growing likelihood that it won't launch on time. Behind the official optimism, NASA is juggling two crises at once, a health-related setback aboard the ISS and a mounting credibility test for its most ambitious program in decades. Both share the same root causes, fewer experienced hands, tighter margins, and decisions shaped as much by politics as by engineering. And that's where the story really begins. So far, it remains unclear what happened to that astronaut. Privacy laws, including the HIPAA Act, prevent NASA from disclosing medical information. However, the space agency has clarified that the problem is not related to an injury, such as a broken bone or a cut. The cause could be a medical issue associated with microgravity, such as appendicitis, kidney stones, or gallstones. Studies show that space travel increases the likelihood of kidney stones several times over compared to life on Earth. Another possible cause could be thrombosis, a blood clot that sometimes occurs in microgravity, particularly among individuals with risk factors. Infection is not considered likely thanks to strict pre-launch quarantine procedures. NASA officials emphasize that the astronaut is in stable condition and is expected to recover. The greater challenge now lies in scheduling. Crew 11's early return may affect the timing of two upcoming missions, Crew 12 and Artemis 2. Under the current plan, Crew 11 will end its mission in January, while Crew 12 is scheduled to launch no earlier than February 15th. This timing could leave only one American astronaut on the ISS for a short period. NASA is reviewing whether Crew 12's launch can be moved up, but it is unlikely that the new crew will depart before Crew 11 returns. Even if Crew 12 launches in early February, that would overlap with the planned launch window for Artemis 2. Of course, in this case, Artemis 2 will take priority, which could result in a brief staffing gap aboard the ISS. Launching Crew 12 in late January is also unlikely. Final certifications, such as static fire tests and flight termination checks, must be completed before liftoff. With Crew 11's return still pending, an earlier launch would be difficult to achieve. On the other hand, many observers doubt that Artemis 2 will launch in February, despite NASA's confident statements about hardware readiness. Their skepticism is understandable given the agency's recent internal challenges. Over the past year, NASA has undergone significant upheaval. A number of long-serving employees, individuals with decades of experience, have left the agency. With them went a vast amount of institutional knowledge and professional judgment that cannot be easily replaced. This shortage of deeply experienced personnel has raised concerns about higher operational risks compared to just a few years ago. The issue is not limited to staffing numbers. It directly affects NASA's ability to manage complex technical problems. During the Artemis I mission, the Orion spacecraft suffered notable heat shield damage on re-entry. Although engineers have since implemented design changes and adjusted flight parameters to improve safety, the absence of veteran experts has prompted questions about NASA's ability to respond effectively to unforeseen challenges. Crew safety depends on timely and accurate interpretation of sensor data, quick responses to abnormal readings, and sound judgment during time-critical launch windows. When the most experienced decision-makers are no longer in the room, the margin for human error inevitably narrows. Adding to these internal pressures are external factors. Some critics fear that NASA may be rushing to meet symbolic milestones, such as aligning Artemis II's launch with the 250th anniversary of the founding of the United States. NASA officials have dismissed these claims, pointing to prior launch delays as proof that safety remains the top priority. Even so, the perception persists that political or ceremonial goals could influence the schedule. Beyond that, 
Even minor disruptions could derail the timeline. A government shutdown, for example, could suspend essential operations. Likewise, small technical issues, such as faulty sensors or problems with ground support equipment, could force last-minute launch delays. Sending astronauts on a lunar mission with a relatively new and less experienced team carries inherent risk. Technology can reduce uncertainty, but cannot replace the insight and instinct that come only from long years of experience. As some within the aerospace community warn, the loss of professional intuition may be the most serious challenge NASA faces as it prepares for humanity's next steps toward the moon. Additionally, this is not the first time America's space ambitions have faced disappointment because of politics. The pattern is decades old. After Apollo, NASA shifted focus to the Space Shuttle program, which was never intended to return to the moon. Later came the Constellation program, which promised a lunar landing but never reached the point where such a return was realistically imminent. Since the early 1970s, the public has heard repeated declarations that the United States was preparing to go back to the moon. There are many concrete examples. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, President George H.W. Bush announced the Space Exploration Initiative, a detailed plan that called for a return to the moon as a step toward Mars. It was a formal national policy, backed by NASA studies and a presidential address, yet it never moved beyond the proposal stage. A similar pattern emerged in the early 2000s under President George W. Bush. His vision for space exploration clearly stated that humans would return to the moon by around 2020, establish a sustained presence there, and then proceed to Mars. That mission was to be carried out by the Constellation program, using Ares rockets and the Altair lunar lander. Billions of dollars were spent, and hardware was built, but the program was ultimately cancelled before completion. The cycle continued into the 2000s. During the Obama administration, the focus quietly shifted away from the moon, though it was never completely ruled out. Then the Trump administration revived the goal under a new name, Artemis. Once again, the language was bold and optimistic. NASA officials, presidents, and lawmakers promised that America would soon return to the lunar surface, this time to stay. Yet the timeline has slipped again and again. Artemis II, Artemis III, commercial lunar landers, the Lunar Gateway. Each milestone has seen its dates pushed back, its mission structure reworked and its cost revised. It's not that nothing has been accomplished, hardware has been built and tested, but for more than 50 years, the same message has been repeated. We are about to go back to the moon. And for more than 50 years, that return has not yet happened. So when people say they've heard all their lives that the United States is just about to go back, they are not speaking from cynicism. They are describing a recurring pattern of announcements, funding surges, program cancellations, and restarts that stretches from the post-Apollo years to the present. Their skepticism is understandable. There is another possibility. Perhaps the real driving force behind Artemis is not exploration, but competition. The fear that another nation, especially China, might establish a lunar foothold first. It's an uncomfortable truth, but many in Washington understand it clearly. Without Chinese competition, Artemis might not exist in its current form. Political will and funding have always depended on strategic rivalry. By 2025, NASA will have spent an estimated $93 billion on the Artemis program. Each space launch system flight costs roughly $4.1 billion, more than some nations spend on their entire space programs each year. For that money, we've gotten one uncrewed test flight. No moon landing yet, no base, just proving we can do what we did 50 years ago, but slower and more expensive. Normally, Congress would ask hard questions. Why are we spending this much? What's the return? Can we afford it? But they're not asking those questions. Because China changed the equation. In 2019, China landed on the far side of the moon. First nation ever to do that. In 2020, they returned samples. These weren't lucky shots. They were systematic capability demonstrations. 
Now, China is building the International Lunar Research Station with Russia and other partners. Target date, 2035 for a permanent base. Crewed missions start around 2030. Location, Moon's South Pole, the same place NASA picked because of water ice. Here's what matters. Whoever gets there first sets the rules. The Outer Space Treaty says you can't claim territory, but it allows safety zones around active operations. First presence becomes control. Why Congress cares. American politicians hate two things, losing to rivals and looking weak. Is China is building a moon base while America doesn't? That's both. Suddenly, 93 billion doesn't seem too expensive. Suddenly, 4.1 billion per launch is a necessary investment. Frame it as national security, and even fiscal conservatives vote yes. This is the same pattern as Apollo. Sputnik launched in 1957. Americans panicked. NASA got funded. We reached the moon in 1969. The moment Soviet competition ended, Apollo was canceled. No rival meant no budget. Artemis survives because China provides that rival remove the competition, and funding disappears within two years. But here's the problem. SLS can't actually compete. It flies once per year. China is planning monthly missions. SLS delivers 27 tons to the moon. China's planning similar or better capabilities with their Long March 9. You can't win a space race flying once per year at 4 billion per launch. You need high flight rates and low costs. That's why Starship matters strategically, not just because it's cheaper, because it's the only system that can match China's planned operational tempo.